Good afternoon, folks. This is Brian Robson, the Executive Clinical Director here at Healthcare Improvement Scotland. And welcome to this, the first in our exciting lineup of QI Connect WebEx series for 2016. In fact, the 19th since the series began. This series came from a request from our national clinical leads here in Healthcare Improvement Scotland to connect frontline clinicians interested in quality improvement with international leaders in the field of improvement. They ask that we make the sessions short, accessible and recorded to allow access at a time that suited them. And since that time, our network, as you'll see in a moment, has expanded dramatically beyond the clinicians at the front line into health and so social care workers across the world. Now, we're using WebEx today and many of you will be, be very familiar with WebEx. And I'm just going to hand you over to Jennifer just now, who will introduce herself and say a little bit more about how we're going to use WebEx. Good afternoon, Jennifer. Thank you, Brian, and welcome to everyone on the session today. Um, I'm just going to take you through a couple of um, housekeeping slides just to get started. And we want today to be a really fun and interactive session. Um, so I would really encourage you all to use the chat function that you can see on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you can't see that um, just now, if you just click on the chat icon at the top right-hand side of your screen, um, and I'll just talk you through how to actually ask questions and comments throughout the session in a moment. If you are having any technical difficulties, or such as not being able to hear the presenter speak, or if you keep losing connection, please message the event manager using the chat function or press star zero on your telephone. So as I say, we want these sessions to be a really interactive and fun learning experience. Um, so we do encourage you to use the chat function to share any questions, comments, or ideas throughout the talk. And there will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end of the session. So please do keep those questions coming. And um, we'll also be sharing some hyperlinks through the chat function to any resources mentioned by Dawn today. So here's the first of our fun interactive parts of the call today. Um, we're actually joined by 20 countries on today's session, so we're delighted to welcome everyone today. Um, we we'll just ask everyone if you could please click on the annotation tool, which is just below the quick start menu, just the top um, left hand side of your screen, it looks like a pen. You just click on that and then go and just click on the arrow circled in red here. And then just click on the map from the country that you're dialing in from. Yeah. Okay, so it looks as though we've got a little bit of a technical problem there. Oh, there's Susan McGaff, his sister out, Mags Watson, Michael Kellett. Oh, crikey, you're all coming in thick and fast now. There we go. WebEx is just catching up. My goodness, the country's just about to tip over a little bit with all of that excitement. And David Grayson, welcome, David, uh, all the way from, uh, from New Zealand. Thank you all very much for joining in. We'll just let that run for a bit, Jennifer. Looks like there's lots of more people just trying to put their put their name on. Hi, Karen, Amanda, welcome. Ahuan, welcome from uh, from Peru, University in Peru. There we go. So welcome to all of our QI connectors across the world. Uh, many, uh, many in the UK and uh, from the US and South America, from Peru, from from New Zealand, uh, welcome to this, uh, the first in our 2016 Healthcare Improvement Scotland QI Connect series. We're now reaching 360 organisations who sign up for our QI Connect uh, series, and some of those organisations we'll see just in a moment. However, uh, and Jennifer uh, is very keen on competitions, so we're just going to start with a little competition. And what we would like you to do, again, using the arrow, 
uh, to the top left of your screen. I'd like to shout out one of the new countries that has joined us uh, for today's call. Um, so I'm going to name the country, and the first arrow to put their, the first person, sorry, to put their arrow on the flag, they'll get a prize. So if you've got your arrows at the ready, the country is Nigeria. Hard lines, Max. Oh, oh, there we go. So it was so quick. Rob. Rob. That catches the funny. Okay. Well done. It looks as though there's a whole list of folks, uh, Susan McGaff and Lorna and David and Eric. Yep, you're all on top now. So that's uh, that's uh, Nigeria down there. We'll have to look at the recording, I think, to see who was first. Is that right? I think uh, we're going to look at the recording just to see who was first. You were all so quick. But well done. We'll find out who that person was just shortly. And that person, oh, hi, Lorraine. That person... Uh, is going to be uh, getting a, a gift sent to them, and the gift is this wonderful book. We'll hear more about that just in a moment. So we'll send that on. So thank you for setting that up, Jennifer, and we'll just find out just shortly who that was that won the book. Thank you for joining in on that. And as I mentioned, we've got uh, over 300 organisations that now join the Healthcare Improvement Scotland QI Connect series. Uh, we used to just have one page of these wonderful logos, and now we've got several pages. Uh, throughout and across uh, the globe. So we're absolutely delighted with you joining us in our quest to connect people on quality improvement. And we always call a special mention to our universities, and I'm absolutely delighted that we've now reached 31 universities, uh, from Harvard to uh, Dunedin to Dundee. Uh, but a special call out to four new universities that have joined us today, to De Montfort University in Leicester, to Gothenburg University, to the University of Surrey, and also to Victoria University in Wellington, New Zealand. So welcome to you. And we've also got a whole host of new organisations joining us uh, this year uh, for, the first series, for the first time in this series. And we've got 54 new organisations joining us. Too many to call out, but absolutely delighted to see our our friends and partners in councils in Edinburgh, in Fife, uh, and in Highland, as well as our partners in the third sector with uh, Age Scotland, Alzheimer's Scotland, uh, and others joining us, and universities from, uh, from uh, Peru and elsewhere. Welcome to QI Connect. Now, we have so many slides, I'm just trying to find the next one. So there's another group of our, of our friends from across uh, the globe who are join, joining QI Connect. Delighted to see Transport Scotland joining us, and also the Health Quality Council in Saskatchewan in Canada, as well as others. So you're all very welcome to Healthcare Improvement Scotland's QI Connect. And as Jennifer mentioned, our, uh, all of our uh, QI Connect series is recorded and watched by many people after the event. And this is our friends in Coabatea that shared this image with us a couple of years ago now of them watching a recorded version of the QI Connect uh, at a time that was convenient to them. And all of that learning is available for you free on the Healthcare Improvement Scotland website. Uh, we'll just send out that uh, link to the, uh, to the address just yeah, shortly. Okay. But all of the, uh, all of the uh, recordings going back now uh, two years are freely available, and they're always worth uh, watch and a listen. And we're always delighted to uh, give a shout out to our partners in ISQA, the International Society for Quality, um, and their fellowship program that consider the QI Connect series uh, an approved resource. Uh, and we're absolutely delighted to be in partnership with, uh, with ISQA, again, a quality improvement organization attempting to connect improvers across the globe. And the small team that we have that bring QI Connect to you, uh, Jennifer, you've heard from, you've heard from me. We have Carmen Forrest, who deals with all the administration and, and your certification after the event. And also we're joined for the first time by Olivia McDougall. Uh, who is our intern here in Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Uh, delighted to have that team working with us. And a key member of that team today is Christine Gregson. You'll hear from Christine a bit later in the call, but Christine is a Scottish Clinical Leadership Fellow who works with me here in Healthcare Improvement Scotland and also with Scotland's Chief Medical Officer, Catherine Calderwood. Uh, and Christine is a doctor in training, a specialist trainee, 
uh, almost becoming an attending uh, or a consultant uh, soon, and uh, with us for a year to learn about quality improvement and policy uh, across Scotland. So you'll hear from Christine uh, just shortly. Remember, please use tweet, uh, Twitter sorry, to tweet as you learn. Uh, our hashtag is HISQI Connect, and you can also follow us and get various links uh, via uh, Twitter as well. So that brings me on to uh, today's speaker. And today's speaker uh, is known across the world. His credentials and biography are too extensive to read out. However, his ability to describe how to escape fire, to describe the plight of his right knee, to consider his moral test, and to think deeply about his challenges around eating soup with a fork have stimulated our thinking for decades. His dedication to make people and families central to our work in improvement and his call to tirelessly ask ourselves, how will it help the patient, have stimulated thousands to think differently about the relationship between patients and professionals. Our, our speaker may be best known, however, in recent years for his powerful storytelling through the medium of his grandchildren and his ability to have huge audiences entranced in deep thought and em empathetic tears, all in the pursuit of improving care. May I welcome to start Healthcare Improvement Scotland's 2016 uh, uh, QI Connect series, Dr. Don Berwick. Uh, thank you so much. Uh Brian and, uh, and Jennifer, it's a delight to join you, and I'm such admiration for the QI Connect uh, process. This kind of open exchange of knowledge and just uh, building a learning world is so crucial, and this is an amazing uh, resource that, uh, that uh, Health Improvement Scotland is bringing, bringing to everyone. I would have to begin also with a personal word of uh, thanks uh, to Brian for our friendship. Brian was an IHI fellow for a year, uh, a Health Foundation fellow at IHI for a year. A number of years ago, we got to know each other very well and remained in continuous touch. And Brian's uh, membership and contributions to the Institute for Healthcare Improvement through the years have been just magnificent. And I, uh, I celebrate our uh, our collaboration. And Brian, thank you so much for this invitation. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, spend about 20 minutes or 25 uh, at the request of uh, Jennifer and Brian <clears throat> to uh, do a little bit of uh, didactic uh, 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 lecturing, I'm going to, going to describe a framework for change, and I want to give it a little motivation and then um, uh, open it up for questions. So, so the, the, the talk I'm going to give you is about new rules, new rules for radical redesign in healthcare. Those of you who know IHI and know the IHI Leadership Alliance uh, understand this language, but for those of you that don't, uh, let me explain it. So if you want to go to the very basics of improvement and change, it seems to me there's really two, two parts to it. Uh, that's it. Um, there's the what and the how. The what is an error, an ec a question of mission, a purpose for any organization, any system, any person engaged in activity. There's a there's a reason for it. Uh, in, if I'm raising my children, my reason is to to create a vibrant and joyous future generation. Uh, if I'm uh, trying to lose weight. Uh, uh, the reason is that I want to be slimmer. Um, healthcare no, is no different. Uh, we have to have a what? We have to know what we would like to be better. And that's the world of improvement. <laughs> Through the years, we've we've developed uh, different frameworks for pursuit of better, and um, they range from focused pursuits like patient safety, not harming people, uh, to um, uh, reliability and science-based care. So we want to make sure that <clears throat> people get the very best chance of long and safe lives by the use of science and practice. <clears throat> There's a whole movement around uh, patient-centered care so that we talk about uh, having care that's dignified and which people feel empowered and so on. So there's always a, a, uh, there's always a what. <clears throat> it, it's canonical in the world of improvement, the world I've lived in for 30 years, that without a what, you don't know what to do. You have to, have a, you have to know what you're trying to accomplish. By the way, what you're trying to accomplish can sometimes be just stability, just getting through the storm, making sure you don't capsize. That's not particularly interesting to me. Uh, I'm in the world of improvement in which the job isn't to get through the storm. It's to develop a whole new way to do, your, to, to do what you're doing to, so it's even ever better, and that's continuous improvement. <clears throat> so that's the what. We have many frameworks for, for goals. Um, in the United States, maybe the most powerful one uh, uh, for a while was the Institute of Medicine's framework from its 
Crossing the Quality Chasm report in 2001. <clears throat> and as most of you know, the Institute of Medicine and National Academy of Sciences outlined six aims for improvement, six what's uh, safe care, so we're not harming people, effective care, so it's uh, aligned with science, patient-centered care to empower patients and families and communities, a timeliness, timely care so the delays are reduced, efficient care to reduce waste, and uh, equitable care to close gaps, especially gaps in racial justice and uh, economic justice in healthcare. And that, that, starting in the year 2001, that, that actually became a set of goals that many in the world actually were pursuing safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, equitable care. That, that uh, continues. Uh, many organizations have those right on their mission statement, um, <clears throat> all about getting better. Uh, that was sort of supplemented or maybe even replaced in 2008 uh, due to the work of two of my colleagues, uh, John Whittington and Tom Nolan. John, John Whitting is a primary care doctor in Peoria, Illinois, and an IHI faculty member, and Tom Nolan is a world's expert on, on improvement uh, methods and my probably my most important mentor through the decades. <clears throat> so John and Tom came forward and said, you know, the IOM goals, that's good. We should have safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, equitable care, but that's not enough. That's only one goal, really. That's better care if you're in care. And they proposed that there were two other goals that needed to be equally and maybe even more embraced. Uh, the second goal would be avoiding the burden of illness in the first place, not treating it when it happens, but keeping it from happening by intervening and helping with population-based health. So there's better care for individuals. And a second goal, improving the health of populations. And they said, but that's not enough. <clears throat> there's actually a third goal, and that has to do with health care's stewardship or mem membership in society at large, and that has to do with reducing costs and that's not that's not an add-on it's not it's not it's not a kind of afterthought it's it's central because healthcare since it's largely funded from public coffers and and also private coffers it takes resources from other productive uses resources to which it's not entitled and if there's a way to do its work at lower cost it should be pursued and lower cost therefore lower per capita cost was the third aim and that became the triple aim better care better health lower cost um, I got to write the paper that explained that with John and Tom in 2008 in Health Affairs. I don't think I've ever been involved with a concept that's got more uh, attraction than that in such a short time. It became a topic really in global conversation now about health care and health systems. Better care, better health, lower cost through improvement, the triple aim. Now, that's all the what. <laughs> now, the second question in improvement is the how. And that's all about process thinking, about thinking in terms of systems, because when you think about trying to achieve something like lower uh, weight in my body or better educated children or a successful business or better health care, there's a system, there's a production system that, that yields that result. And that's the, that's the systems thinking view that's at the absolute core of the sciences of improvement. There's a system. And here's the, ca here's the catch. That system has an inherent capability. So uh, my car has a top speed. It's, a, it's an inherent capability of that car to go at that top speed. I can't I could yell at the car. It wouldn't make any difference at all. It's, it's the capability of that concept. There are processes. There are systems. They produce these results, safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, equitable care, for example, and they have a capacity. That is the front door to modern improvement because then the job of improvement is to make changes, changing the system. So the what is whatever goal you want. Pick the triple aim, which I do. And the how is changing the system so it has a different capability. That's quite distinctive. That, that, that theory is not, it's not even the dominant theory about improvement, not the dominant theory of how. The dominant theory of how is still around the world, everywhere, inspection. It's study the result and, I don't know, act on it, punish someone, create rewards, do incentives. It, unfortunately, a lot of the activity in the world around alleged improvement is actually just measuring. I always love the quotation I first heard somewhere in Africa, which is that measuring a pig doesn't make the pig fatter. Well, measuring a system doesn't make the system more capable. You have to change the system. So anybody interested in improvement is interested in changing the system of work, the system of production, if you don't mind me using that term. Well, how do you do that? Well, every system of production has a kind of superordinate set of design principles. My father was a doctor in a small town in Connecticut. He saw patients as a GP. And he had design principles. He never would have thought of it that way. But if I, we, we watched his work, we'd say, oh, he's, he's accommodating a certain set of rules. Here's, 
because my father's rule was, for example, come and see me. I mean, after all, he had an office, he had a secretary, he made appointments, and, and that basic idea to get care, you come and see me, that was a rule. Uh, another rule that my father learned in his training and practiced his whole career was the doctor knows best. Um, I have technical knowledge, you don't, and you come to me with a problem and I give you the solution to the problem because I have knowledge. Um, now, in, in the healthcare system at large, we don't actually, we never wrote those rules down. They're, they're latent, they're there. But beginning really the, the turning point of the Institute of Medicine report in 2001, a very important assertion was made in that report you'll find the, the, the statement, I helped write it, that in its current form, habits, and environment, the healthcare system is incapable of meeting the needs and, and uh, 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 providing the public with the care it, it needs and deserves. Incapable, that's a really important word because it means we have a system that can't do it. We have a car that can go 100 miles an hour, but it can't go 150 and we need 150. So, so the question is what would be the set of rules, the design principles that might lead to the emergence of a system that has different capabilities. Now, the Institute of Medicine in 2001, in Crossing the Quality Chasm, laid out 10 simple rules, 10 design rules that it said, if, if we actually rebuilt our work around these principles, uh, we would have a, a system that made substantial progress on those six goals. When the triple aim came along, it increased the stakes because the actual design principles that would make, say, care safer or more effective aren't enough. They don't get you to the triple aim. So IHI, a couple years ago, decided to launch a project with now 42 hospitals uh, or health systems around the United States, and IHI is very interested in globalizing this effort, to, to go to a different level and say, okay, everybody, if we want to get to the triple aim, what would be the how, the design rules for a system that could have care that's better for individuals, healthier for populations, and lower costs? And that leads to what I'm going to talk with about for the next 10 minutes, and that is new rules, new rules for what now is called in that system radical redesign of healthcare. Now, by a rule here, we mean a guidance principle, something like my father's come and see me, but what's the other, what's a new rule, a new way to think about production? It doesn't tell you the details. It doesn't know exactly, exactly how to implement this or what the details are, but, with, but it gives you the general directionality of the construction of the new system. Notice, by the way, we are not talking about inspection. So it's crucial here that, that underneath what I'm showing you is a commitment by leaders and boards and publics and governments and workers to understand that it's, this is all about change. It's not about blame. It's not about inspection and sorting. It's not about selections and, in my opinion, not about markets. It's about the taking on the hard job of making a different system of production together. So let's, what I want to do is show you the rules quickly, and I'm going to try to give you some examples of what they are. But these, this is, by the way, not the Bible. These are just, this is a draft, you consider it. It will evolve over time, but I'll show you the, the rules as they've emerged in the Leadership Alliance. Rule one, change the balance of power. Remember my father's rule? I'm the doctor. You tell me your problem, I give you the answer. Now we know much more. We know that when there's um, a kind of partnership or relationship between the people who seek help and their families and their communities on the one hand and healthcare on the other, we have a different production system at work. That is, the care is co-produced. It's co-designed. And the, 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 the power, if you want to look at it that way, the, the, um, the, the right to judge the care, the right to, to shape the care is, is actually devolved largely from the people that give the care to the people that get the care or want the care or want to participate in the care, the patient, the family, and communities. Now, we have amazing examples in the world for every single rule of a place that's done this. For example, Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center in Cincinnati uh, it completely redesigned its, its, uh, its cystic fibrosis care guided by kids and families uh, that have the burden of cystic fibrosis. They're the designers, or, or the, at least the co-designers, extremely powerful. At Cincinnati, uh, almost every committee, and certainly the board and governance, is fully populated with patients, families, and community representatives. In NUCA, the wonderful example in Anchorage, Alaska, which I believe you studied in, in, the, um, in the QI Connect system, I believe that's true. Uh, you, you, if you know it, you, you know that that native-owned system in Anchorage, which treats 60,000 Alaska natives, has, they don't use the term patient there very much. They use the term customer owner because there, the governance, the design, the, 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 the uh, vision 
the processes emerge from, uh, com from constant dialogue with the people served. Probably one of the most important papers that's come out in the decade on, on this idea has just come out, uh, written by uh, Marin Batalden and Paul Batalden and, and a set of other colleagues uh, called Co-Production of Health Service. It's in the British Medical Journal, Quality, uh, Journal of Quality and Safety. It came out just in uh, the first issue of 2015, I believe, or maybe later than that. Um, hopefully your colleagues on the line can find that and, and, and text in. It's a brilliant paper showing how this balance of power change can be accomplished and should be. Principle number two, standardization. Now, now, standardization is essential to improvement at some level. That's the Toyota production process, the idea of standard work, uh, doing it the same way. Why? Well, because it simplifies things. Uh, a procedure with, with lots of variation in it well, you know, uh, is very hard to maintain at a high level of reliability. And after all, if there's good science, if we know what to do for a migraine headache in general, it, it'd be good to write it down and do it. So this kind of promising, stand, promising the best and, and, and consolidating around it, very important principle in modern improvement. And it, 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 its old form was protocols and guidelines. The modern version might be standard work in lean production, but that, and it's countercultural. My father would not have understood this. If you went to my father and said, standardize your care of heart attacks, along with all the other doctors in our region of Connecticut, he would have thrown you out of his office. He said, I'm the doctor. You know, I, I know what to do. Well, maybe he did, but nowadays when the volume of scientific evidence is just phenomenally large, tens of thousands, literally tens of thousands of relevant studies appearing in the literature every year, no one mind can, can capture this. And so certain forms of standardization are essential to reduce unnecessary variation and to free the time that's wasted in, in, in unnecessary variation so that it can be applied to individual care. So proper standardization. But note, it says standardize what makes sense, and that leads to rule three, which is don't standardize. Customize to the individual. Because everybody's the only patient. Every person has their own set of needs. And if we really believe that quality is the alignment of work and need, then a high capacity, triple aim, organized system has to ask every single individual uh, how they want it. As Maureen Bisignano and Susan Edgman Levitan have said, it's, it's shifting the question from what matters, what's the matter with you, to what matters to you. And in the Leadership Alliance and many other organizations around, around the world, really, this, this question, this, this central question to every single individual, how do you want it? What is your way? Who are you? What do you bring to this? Becomes central to the production system. Is this consistent with standardization? Well, yes and no. Proper standardization, rule two, sets in place a simplified core platform of work that frees the energies to allow you then to customize the, the, at the point of contact to the individual. Um, and, and that balance between proper standardization to make work easier and proper customization to perfect the match to the individual's needs is the modern way to think about uh, systemic improvement. It's sometimes called mass customization. That's a term you could Google and look it up. That's how in manufacturing deals with it, build a common platform chassis, but then allow attachments to occur that can make it perfect for every single individual. Uh, great companies do that, and you'll know it. Great hotels do that. Healthcare can do that, too. And, it, and it's, by the way, if it's better for the workforce, it's easier to work in such a system. Bell & Health is a really great example of this, where they're working with their patients to help design uh, GYN and oncology services, for example, in which the, the system's capable of literally asking every individual, what's your way? Uh, the next rule is promote well-being. It's, it's moving outside healthcare. This is the better health part of the system. And the point is that what matters to people the most, if you ask them the question, what matters to you, will rapidly bring our attention and our processes outside what we would normally call healthcare. Big, big challenge in a healthcare industry addicted to volume and production and what it does, just doing what it does more. This is a change of mentality. I'll give you one interesting example of this being pursued right now with IHI's help in the Conversation Project. If you haven't Googled the Conversation Project, you should. It was started by the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Ellen Goodman. And it has to do with really assuring for every single person that their care in advanced illness as they approach the end of their life is exactly what they want and how they want it. We know from great research, the support study of Robert Wood Johnson and others, that we don't do that at all, not in the U.S. The end-of-life care system in the U.S. has migrated very far 
from what patients and families and communities and even doctors and nurses say is wanted in the end of life. This does not, by the way, mean that everybody gets the same care. Quite, it, quite the opposite. This would mean that if you are the kind of person who, as you approach the end of your life, you want every single technology that possibly could extend your life by one minute, you can get it. Uh, and I personally believe that it would be appropriate because we want to customize it. The good news, of course, is that most people don't want that. They want emotional support. They want to be with their families. They don't want to be in institutions. They don't want to be connected to a lot of machines. They want comfort and solace and meaning in the last stages of life. Well, this involves resources and attitudes and approaches that extend way outside healthcare. And that's just the beginning. If you think about other burdens we have around chronic illness care and proper birthing and uh, you name it, you're going to find that there are community-based resources that, that we would then call into play. The next uh, principle is joy in work. What is that doing there? I mean, after all, uh, aren't we talking about patients and families? Well, we are. However, it is, it's true, whether you're a nice person or not, that uh, you can't get superb care, let alone, you can't get superb experience of care, let alone triple aim, without a workforce that is enjoying what they're doing. That is, Dr. Deming used to say, pride and joy in work. It's all about pride and joy in work. A lot of managers, a lot of workers think this is naive and fluffy. It isn't. Uh, and, and one of the greatest risks in healthcare systems around the world today is the erosion and loss of uh, joy in, 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 in the work, in the healthcare workforce, doctors, nurses, managers, pharmacists, receptionists, therapists. We can't do that. It, it, that will be a formula for uh, disarray and demoralization, not just of the workforce, but, but of patients. And so a lot of energy in the leadership alliance is going back to basic questions about what is it that creates pride and joy in the healthcare workforce. Some of the best uh, investigations so far are being led by uh, an IHI faculty person uh, at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Steve Swenson. Mayo Clinic and Swenson have really gone deeply into the scientific literature about what creates a joyous relationship between people and their work. Uh, <clears throat> Coastal Medical, uh, an alliance member in Rhode Island, has taken this forward with with um, into its, its uh, compensation system. It actually is <coughs> working very hard on the triple aim. They've saved substantial amounts of resources, and the chief executive, Dr. Al Caros, has literally walked around his organization handing out uh, uh, rewards, che checks, to every single person, every, and not just doctors and nurses, everyone saying, well, we did it and we can share. Um, there is a, a very edgy uh, resource that's on this slide. It's called Don't Walk By. Uh, Lieutenant General David Morrison, who's chief of the Australian Army, has made a video message in response to some uh, unacceptable behaviors in the Army in which he gets a four-minute message, which I, I would suggest you might want to listen to. It's very edgy. It's almost offensive in how strong it is, but you can see a leader saying, here are the norms, and we can't do this. We can't behave this way. You have to behave in, behave in a way that is thoroughly and, and, and infinitely respectful of each other. It's well worth your watching. Bell and Health has taken this forward using a phrase that Lieutenant General Morrison uses, which is don't walk by. You can't walk by transgressions in, in unacceptable behaviors. It creates a culture that accepts the erosion of joy. Uh, another principle connected to joy and work uh, is make it easy. This is one of my favorite of the Leadership Alliance principles. It has to do with taking away barriers to effective work and interaction barriers that affect both staff and patients, families, and clinicians. It's nonsense. It's taking away stupid stuff. Um, and, and, and it's been dealt with at the Leadership Alliance in terms of rules. Indeed, there was just a week, January 11th to 15th, which was breaking the rules week for better care in the Leadership Alliance in which members were urged to work with their staffs and patients to identify hassles that make no sense and stop them, uh, stop them if they can. Uh, the general framework was that the, the hassles come in, in various uh, categories, uh, four in particular that I've thought of. One is habits, stuff we have learned to do just because we do it, but we could change it once we realize it's there. Second are administrative prerogatives in which there's no, raw, no law or regulation. Just administrators have created organiza organizational rules that stand in our way. The third are mythic regulations, interpretations of regulation that are wrong, such as in the United States, HIPAA myths, myths about the HIPAA rule that are just, they're not right, they're incorrect, but they, they, they persist. And a fourth would be real regulations and policies that exist either 
corporate or governmental where uh, they're wrong. They're just stupid rules, and they're, the idea of the leadership alliance is to exercise collective voice, get together and advocate for change in rules that hurt patients and staff. Uh, in the early, uh, we, in the week uh, last week, which, which the breaking of rules week, you, you would, it was thrilling, stunning to see the number of ideas that emerged from staff and members about things that could be done differently. IHI, the Institute for Health Improvement, characteristically brought it to itself, and in the very first week at IHI, asking not about healthcare rules but about IHI rules of its staff, 70 ideas got generated of, of, of rules that can be changed and will be changed to make work easier. The next principle is move knowledge, not people. Back to my father's simple rule, come and see me. Uh-uh, not today, not today. I haven't met a bank teller in years. Uh, I, I order my pizza online, uh, and I can get help. Now, I can get the help you would have had to go see my father for all sorts of other ways than visits. In some ways, to overstate it a bit, visits and institutional stays are dinosaurs. Uh, for a vast, I pro suggest, I think likely the majority of visits and maybe the majority of institutional stays today are replaceable by other ways of reaching out with help. Uh, and so one of my favorite examples of this is Project ECHO at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine, projecting a very sophisticated tertiary level guidance on care of very complex illnesses like HIV AIDS and hepatitis C and uh, 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 severe depression and uh, frail elderly care, projecting that knowledge through uh, web-based supports out to every single little town in New Mexico, and that now ECHO's gone international. Here's a very, this is a proprietary innovation that I've run into. My friend uh, Bonnie Zell has created an organization called Lemonade, and you can find them at LemonadeHealth.com. Uh, there's a list of conditions, there are eight right now, which Lemonade feels that through simple web-based interaction, both synchronous and asynchronous, real-time and delayed, on a whole range of common problems like acne and acid reflux, they can get help to patients for an extremely low cost. The cost of a lemonade visit right now is set at $15, and they're trying to drive it down. This would replace visits to the institutions that cost uh, uh, dozens, if not hundreds, uh, of dollars. And this is the future, this kind of reaching out with really good, disciplined, well-vetted, monitored care uh, through means other than visits. Collaboration and cooperation is another simple rule. It looks like you don't even need to say it, but you do. We've built up silos and walls throughout healthcare and breaking down barriers, of becoming really the team we need to be, both with inside and outside healthcare. This is uh, core. This may, might need to be rule number one, just, just around changing the balance of power. Uh, and I believe it should be part of the new definition of professions, uh, not heroic professions, but cooperating professions. Uh, within, I, within the Leadership Alliance, again, Bell & Health is doing an amazing project called um, Live Algoma, which is uh, it's a county that it's in, and it's, it, it's trying to help the whole county mobilizing all of its resources. And I must uh, tip my hat to Scotland, the early years collaborative in which the healthcare system is reaching out with educators and parents and communities trying to make it the best place to grow up uh, is a spectacular example of high-level cooperation. The Live Algoma Project is part of another IHI effort called the 100 Million Healthier Lives Campaign, which is a global effort focused on the better health rule and that can't, the better health goal of the AAA, and that cannot be accomplished by healthcare alone. It can't happen. So in that project, uh, each segment of the society, in this case pursuing health community through action of employers, action of individuals, actions of communities, actions of children themselves and those who take care of children, and in the commons view is, is the prescription. and redesigns are affecting every single one of those um, those uh, components uh, for the Healthy Children Initiative, its own purpose uh, to help kids make the right choices, to understand the effect, the need for community-level work, and to follow progress uh, religiously. The next to the last rule is assume abundance. Uh, in healthcare, we don't. We complain. We always say we want more. Well, at some level of expenditure, that's an appropriate request, and I'd say for lower income countries, absolutely, we need to put more into healthcare. But for most developed democracies, and certainly in America, we've got much more than we need at 16, 17, 18% of gross domestic product. We, we need to reverse thinking here. Instead of saying what we don't have, notice what we do have. And that idea of looking for resources we have not yet brought into, the, into play without asking for more money, that's part of, that's an essential redesign concept. If you want to see examples, look, for example, at the elder care of 30 years ago developed by Unlock and now, rep, now represented in our PACE programs. 
or I think brilliantly the Plain Tree program, which is itself several decades old in which the resources of patients and families and communities are actually brought into acute care settings to make those settings better at no additional cost or lower cost. And the final rule is probably the toughest of all in some ways. It's return the money. Remember, it's the triple aim, better care, better health, lower cost. It isn't lower cost if health care keeps the money. That's the bottom line here issue. In, in America, where we fund a lot of health care privately, we're talking here about premium levels. Unless the health insurance premium has actually fallen, not tip bending the curve, but fallen, the money hasn't cut back to other uses, private uses or public uses. Unless the government's budget for health care has fallen, the money hasn't gotten back to other uses. So this is a really tough discipline in an industry now really addicted to revenue-based um, revenue based, uh, uh, business models. It's to, it's to return money to other uses than health care and let the money leave the health care system. What level of resources should be retained by healthcare to do its work on the triple aim? I don't know. I have a kind of suspicion that something in the range of 10 to 11 or 12 percent of gross domestic product might be a good target. In the U.S., we're at 18 or 17. I believe the U.S. with near certainty to get, could get to 15 percent of GDP without harming a hair on anyone's head and making care far better, indeed getting there by making care far better, and that money could get back to our roads and our schools and our laborers and our corporations for global competitiveness and so, so, so on. So that's another, another part of the discipline. Uh, I will um, stop there, return the ball to Jennifer. I appreciate the chance to have carried on here, and I welcome your questions and your critique. I think if this doesn't make sense to you, then uh, I may well be wrong. So please, uh, please open the lines. Great, Don. Thank you very much indeed. And what a great array of things you gave us to think about. And the chat box has been buzzing. So, folks, please uh, chat more questions in. I'll keep a lookout for them just now. But in the meantime, uh, Don, let me introduce you to Christine. Good afternoon, Christine. Good afternoon. Hi, Don. Uh, thank you for a really interesting and challenging talk. Um, as you know, I'm a junior doctor. And what I'm really interested in finding out is how do you create the culture and climate that empowers clinicians in training to challenge the status quo and help them shape radical redesign? Uh, it's a great question and really important, Christine, because working upstream with people like you, young people who will be the leaders of the future is, is the way to create a future. Um, I think a, a, a classical answer would be uh, it depends on the senior people, on the deans and the, the executives and the governments and the private players that have influence on the content and aims of the preparation of young professionals. Uh, young professionals today need to be trained to be citizens in the pursuit of the triple aim and activists in pursuit of the designs that can achieve the triple aim, like the radical redesign principles. And so one could take what I just told you and work it through the curriculum of a young professional and say, what, what would they need to learn and master as they go along? Uh, teamwork, uh, cooperation, uh, reaching across to Local communities, a brilliant example of this, absolutely brilliant, is now underway with a brand new medical school, Hofstra LIJ, Hofstra LIJ in the New York City area, where now they've started a medical school, but you can't be a medical student there until you first become an emergency medical technician. You have to ride ambulances, get the training, provide services to people in their homes, interact with the hospital system. Why? Because it changes your mind. Once you've been through months of EMT service and then enter medical school, you understand the interdependencies. You've been in people's homes. You under, you've been yelled at by, by perhaps an arrogant doctor, and you're saying, I'm never going to do that when I'm a doctor. It changes the way people think, and we need to do that. So, yeah, top down, and I call on those who are stewards of the curricula and look at, look at the designs we need for the future and say, are your people being prepared for those designs? From, lower, from within, I'm an optimist. I come, remember, from a generation that was, say, protesting against the Vietnam War or in favor of civil rights. And, you know, if you go back to that history in the 60s, that was youth-driven. That was youth-driven. You had young people, 20-somethings, even younger, in the streets saying, we, we don't want our nation to do this. We need to change. And I've, I've been part of that. I've been part of this movement by youth to create a future. And I encourage youth to be active in this field, not just students of health profession, all youth, but health professional students in particular. IHI started the IHI Open School uh, about four or five years ago. I thought we'd have perhaps a few hundred or a few thousand young people who wanted to learn together and network. As of today, the Open School has over 300,000 
uh, participants around the world in over 75 countries with, I think, 750 chapters. Anyone on this line that doesn't know the IHI Open School, go there, especially if you're young. Uh, you get on the IHI.org website, look at Open School, enroll, and you're there. You can take courses. You can dialogue with hundreds of thousands of people around the world who want to see change. And I think that movement from below has a tremendous amount of potential, and I, I will cheer it on. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, John, for that really inspiring answer. Um, I really appreciate the way you looked at it. As, um, so it would be great to approach it from both the top down, but also to motivate clinicians in training to really get involved in policy improvement. Yes, thanks very much, Christine, and thanks for that, Don. So, Don, the, the chat box has been really busy. I'm going to start with a question here from Kath Stevenson, who is a Canadian but is currently a PhD candidate and associate professor at Young Shopping in, uh, in Sweden. And Kath uh, asks, changing the balance of power can still be quite a scary process for some health professionals. And how do we make the involvement and meaningful reach of the right patient representatives? So it can be scary, and how do we get the right patient representatives to help? Um, it's scary at first, of course. Uh, we were trained to take control, not to cede it. I understand that. Uh, but believe me, ten minutes into that process, it gets a lot less scary because it's so much fun and because the people you, you, you are trying to help are so, so appreciate it. Uh, patient voice is the entrance door. Uh, and I would say no matter what level of training you're in, uh, ask people how you're doing. It's really not that hard a thing, technically. Uh, I often tell the story of when my wife was pregnant with our second child, Dan, mid-trimester or so. We went and saw a wonderful obstetrician, Paul Goldstein, and Paul did the exam and talked to us. And then he said, I know you're very busy, but would you please just join me for another couple of minutes? I have a question. And he sat us in his office, and he said, Don and Ann, uh, Today, as, as you experienced my examination, Anne, as I've talked to you, Don and Anne, as you met with my staff, is there anything at all that could have been better from your point of view? And he really meant it. I mean, wouldn't, what, a, what, if, what if every health professional encounter had that question embedded in it? Uh, is there anything that could have been better from your point of view? Now, that's a simple-minded version of changing the balance, but it is perfectly accessible, and uh, if we get skilled at that, we'll learn and we'll grow. More generally, I think invite patients into processes. So patients and families, if you're designing, if you have a quality improvement team, make sure there are not just one, but several patients and family members there. If you're, if you're in charge, if you're nominating committee of a board of trustees, insist that your board of trustees in the future will have patients and families and community people on it. The right patient, I don't know, tough question. Uh, you want people who will not, you know, who, who, will, who will be dignified or have a sense of how to communicate and cooperate, but I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be too severe about that. I'd say you, everyone can probably bring value unless there's some obvious reasons not to have a particular person there. When I chaired the Commission of Inquiry on, uh, on the, on the Mid-Staffordshire uh, disaster in England, uh, we had about 15 members, I think, or 16, and three were patients uh, who, or loved ones of a patient that had been killed by an error. And uh, I think every single member of that group would say that of, the, of, of all of us, scholars and pedigreed researchers in this field, of all of the members of the committee, the three that constantly brought value, constantly added new insights and really good ideas the patients come for, they, they were the best. And uh, I think you'll find the same if you start to start to change. What are we worried about? Avaricious requests, inability to actually meet needs? Uh, no, I don't think so. Most of the research we show is that patients are not insatiable. They're smart just like you are. They, they, they want what helps and don't want what doesn't. And, and if we engage them, I think we'll find that out. Thank you very much for that, Don. And you've actually picked up a number of the, the aspects also raised by Juan um, Limo from Peru, who's a physician uh, out there who was asking about uh, the co-producers and the, the patients. I'd like to skip to uh, an area that you talked about around joy at work. So we've got a question from Alistair Philp, who is an improvement advisor at the Scottish Government, and a follow-up question from Arvind uh, Varaya, who's the National Clinical Lead for Medicines here, Medicine Safety here at Healthcare Improvement Scotland and a consultant toxicologist. Let me just give you a couple of these. So Alistair says, how do we motivate people who get joy from work for being acknowledged as crisis managers and fixers when we advocate and recognize, solve and share rather than fix and forget? In other words, what he's saying there is 
how, how do we actually get the people who actually get motivated around joy at work to be part of that um, part of that uh, agenda for improvement? I think I understand the question, but Alex, if I get it wrong, tell me. Uh, you know, uh, organizations have currency. They have they have they have money, of course, but they also have currency and affiliations, in celebration, in acknowledgments, and uh, a little bit of that goes a long, long way. So if there are 100 doctors on your staff and only 15 of them really want to get involved in the leadership of change and improvement, they're the only ones that find joy in that right now, help them, uh, celebrate them, give them resources, create status, call, you know, call them uh, champions, call them fellows, um, uh, uh, talk with them, be visible with them. So the celebration of the... Uh, of the early adopters, the leaders creates a it creates the opposite of negative incentive. It creates a it creates a positive traction in which uh, those people become uh, they're, they're helped to become the leaders they can be. And and I think that kind of embrace it's so much better than fighting the battles all the time, going after the, the negative side, the dark side. And so this this embrace is is, is really key. When, when I ran uh, Medicare and Medicaid in the United States, I tried, I failed, but I tried to convince the Office of Management and Budget and the, uh, and the uh, Department of Health and Human Services to create a fellowship, a Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Fellowship System. I wanted 5,000 fellows around the United States who would be embedded. They would, they would be doctors and nurses and pharmacists and managers in hospitals all over the U.S., but who would know they were part of the change process because they would be named and credentialed by Medicare and Medicaid as local leaders for the incorporation of changes and improvements. We got 70 slots authorized instead of 5,000. We put out a call for applications, and we had 800 applicants, and I think within the first 10 days, people all over the nation wanted to help. And and that and let you know, build on it, go with it, go with the positive. That really is a key management idea for me, and it, it's related to joy. Uh, England, by the way, you know now the English National Health Service has this process called the Q process, which is underway, and it um, it, um, it 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 is aiming, I think, ultimately for 5,000 people in England who will be Q fellows. It's being ministered through the Health Foundation, and I met with the first 220 or 230 of them when I was in England uh, a couple of months ago, and oh my goodness, it was just so joyous. Everybody was excited; they were literally on their feet with excitement about getting to help, and that there's a lot of joy successful in that. And Brian, let me embarrass you. I mean, you were an IHI fellow. You were part of a much smaller group. But what did it feel like to you to be taken from your normal work and put someplace for a year to learn and practice modern improvement? How, what did that do to your sense of uh, purpose or your, your enjoyment of your role? Yeah, I can tell everyone's already feeling really sorry for me getting out of work and coming to work with you for a year. Um, yeah, no, a lot of what you just said, Don, it was exposing, uh, exposed you to an organization that uh, where you didn't have to seek permission, uh, it allowed you to go and, and experience where joy was happening at, at work, um, and allowed you to tell the story of others. I mean, one of the great things about IHI was telling stories about everything that you saw the week before when you were out of the office and bringing those stories back into the office and sharing them more widely. So it was, in, it was enabling, it was empowering, and there was joy and, and fun uh, in almost the whole year. So yeah, that, that's a, a, a deep dive immersion. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, lot of, uh, a lot of similarities there, yeah. I'll guess it was disrupting some of the, even you had, had mental models in mind or design ideas that were being threatened or Quest, called into question about what you were learning. I, I assume that might have been the case. How did you deal with the cognitive, the cognitive challenge? Well, I guess it was made a bit easier by the fact that I was with other fellows, with uh, five others, three from the U.S. and two from the U.K. that all went in and felt all felt felt very uncomfortable because it was so different. We were so encouraged to not ask permission, and the rules were clear. The rules were there to enable you to do more. Uh, and do things quicker, uh, rather than rules that stopped you doing things. Whether it was from from, uh, from finance making it easy, or whether it was uh, from Paul Hamnet and the team in, in the IT section to help us with great technology, and that probably takes us on to one of the questions, Don. So there's a, a question here about your touch on technology. So um, 
uh, we have a, a question about, about technology and how you, this is from uh, Lorna Hall, the director of McPherson Hall Consultancy in here in Scotland, uh, and she says, we get caught up in all the governance and red tape issues when trying to use technology to reach patients. What thoughts do you have around how we move this forward? Uh, sympathy, <laughs> yes. I mean, after all, we built the regulatory and governance frameworks around the old production system, so naturally, the, the regulations support the past, not the future. And this is a big challenge. So what would we do? I think first, um, maybe go back to the rule-based analysis we had one of the breaking the rules thing. Remember, it was habits, administrative choices, uh, misinterpretations of regulation and regulation. Go through that sequence. Some of the barriers to adoption of really productive ideas uh, maybe just habits. And maybe it, we think it's a rule because it's convenient for us to imagine one. But actually, when we explore it, we say, oh, no, we could do that. And I think there might be a lot of that. I don't really know. Second would be administrative prerogatives. Yes, uh, it may not be the government. It may not be the regulator. It may be simply the, the, the chief of operating officer or the, or, the, or the board that has made a rule. And that needs dialogue. That needs a smart enough board to talk with the staff about better ways to do this and then a, a courageous enough executive to say, OK, old rule's gone. The third would be myths and habits. That's a very, very big one. I really do believe there's a lot of myths perpetuated. Uh, they're just repeated, and then they become rules. I hear this about HIPAA all the time. We can't do that because of HIPAA. Absolutely wrong. But once you've said it 10 times, it, it, it masquerades as a fact. And that involves corporate and, and collective inquiry that's really, really disciplined. And when regulations have to change, we need to be active politically. Uh, take the lemonade. Uh, uh, product I showed you that happens to be for profit, so I want to be careful. I'm not endorsing that solely, but it's an interesting idea. Or take the Echo Project, which is nonprofit. How would you do that? To take it, take it on. L look at your organization and say, where could Echo help us? Uh, imagine that you did it, uh, and then analyze the barriers and change them. Uh, we, we, we need to we need to get there. Um, the leaders will be the ones to pay the highest price at this point. They're the ones who will have to put the energy in to change the rules, uh, change the ambient rules, and, uh, but it's going to be worth it. That's the new care. Thanks, Don. And the next question, this is probably the last question for the session, but Andrew Winter, who's, uh, who is the clinical lead for eHealth or Health IT at Greater Glasgow and Clyde and also a consultant physician, he's not asking an IT question, but he goes to your point around regulation. And what he says is, how do we work with the regulatory and inspection bodies, including Healthcare Improvement Scotland, to move from inspection to change and have a breaking the rules week? Most staff are overwhelmed with constant rules and appraisals and recognition of training and the ever increasing mandatory training and things that we can't see things that they can't do without. And he wonders whether the General Medical Council and the Nursing Midwifery Council would support a breaking the rules week. Well, that's more a question for you in Scotland and for me. Uh, uh, you know, exploration, you know, the handshake that starts the exploration has to have be bi-directional. You have to have a workforce. This includes doctors and nurses willing to stick out their hands and say, I'm ready to try. And you have to have regulators and rule makers who say, I'm ready to help you try. And, and there's, no, there's no simple answer to that unless you want to get in the streets and, and, and have an armed revolution, I suppose. I, I would think that there's plenty of intelligence in, uh, in NHS Scotland uh, to uh, recognize the potential this could bring and plenty of goodwill on the, on the side of caregivers to try it. One of the real keys here, by the way, is the word try. So everything gets safer. Everything gets safer if you understand, plan, do, study, act, if you realize everything you, you might want to try in this world could be done as a trial. You say, we're, we're not going to do it. We're going to try it. And we're going to try for one week or, or some limited scale and, and see how it feels. And I, I'm so confident about the modernization, the benefit of this kind of modernization, that I think if it is tried, it will succeed because it's going to feel better and it's going to produce better care at lower cost, triple aim. Don, thank you so much. I think that was a wonderful talk, and the chat box is, is still buzzing uh, just now. Many people wanting to try the Break the Rules Week, and very many of them mentioning small tests of change as the way forward. So, Don, thank you very much indeed for taking us through this, uh, this talk today. And we're going, to, uh, we're going to move on now and just to tell people a little bit more about the next uh, few sessions. This is what the year looks like. I asked Jennifer to get 10 Blow Your Socks Off speakers for Healthcare Improvement Scotland's QI Connect series. And we've got eight wonderful speakers lined up, starting, as you've just heard, with Don Berwick himself. 
All the information about these speakers are on your uh, on the uh, website, and the two uh, the two um, uh, secret speakers will re will re reveal to you at the next session. Thanks, Jennifer. Next slide. And just to say that the next session is on the 22nd of February, uh, 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, UK time, and it's Joe Bibby, the Director of Strategy at the Health Foundation, and you heard in Don's talk uh, a number of references to the work of the Health Foundation. So QI Connectors, it's been great to have you with us this afternoon. Thanks for all your chat, and thanks once again to Don Berwick for an inspiring talk. Thank you. All. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you, Don. Uh, Katrina, are you still there?